Thank you for tuning in. This is 101.5 KZKA FM, Home of the Wolves, here at the Los Angeles Academy of Arts and Enterprise. This is an interview made by students for the Los Angeles community to showcase local artists, musicians, politicians, and local creatives. Please enjoy. Hello, welcome to 101.5 KZKA FM. This is Jesse Lopez. And this is Kayana. And I'm here with guest Moctezuma Esparza. For those who don't know Montezuma, this is a Mexican-American producer, entertainment executive, entrepreneur, and community activist. In addition, he's one of the founders of the, of this station and charter school of Los Angeles Academy of Arts and Enterprise. So uh, how are you doing, Mr. Esparza? I'm happy to be here. Happy to be with both of you. It's exciting to me. Getting to do more radio. That's, that's cool. All right, so we're going to start with the first question. Um, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Well, first off, uh, I don't consider myself uh, Mexican-American. I'm a Chicano. Chicano, okay. Okay. So Chicano is a word that describes me from my cultural point of view and uh, as an identity, right? So it's an identity that I chose. Um, and uh, although Mexican-American would be uh, certainly an acceptable word, uh, it's not what I choose to identify with. So I was born and raised here in Los Angeles and um, went to school in Lincoln Heights at uh, Murchison Street Elementary School and then Lincoln Junior and Senior High School, just like your school here. I went to a six-year high school. This is a seven-year high school. And from there I went to CLA. And I got my bachelor's at UCLA in film and a master of fine arts uh, in film also from UCLA. And it was during that time that um, I was given the opportunity to be a radio host. And so I did radio as a producer and on-air personality for seven years, from when I was 19 years old until I was 26 on KPFK FM, which is 90.7. Wow. wow. That's really cool. Um, so uh, how was your high school experience? I hated high school. <laughs> wow. uh, the teachers were assuming that all of the students who were almost all uh, Mexican descent or African American, a few Asians, that almost all of us would not go to college and that we were all going to be following the footsteps of our parents and being workers or housewives or secretaries or cooks. And so I hated it because uh, my dad had given me the uh, example uh, that learning was important and could free me and could allow me to do whatever I wanted to do in life. And so there were a couple of teachers that uh, made a difference for me. And I could see that on my campus where there were 3,000 students, there were only one or two a year that were getting support and going on to college. And when I graduated, it was, I think, the highest number of students that went on to a four-year university. Out of 300 in my original class, only 150 graduated and only four went on to college, a four-year college. So I wasn't happy at all. Uh, it was clear to me that we were being discriminated against and not being given the opportunity to achieve what we could in life. So I hated it. Wow, that's, that's we pretty crazy. High school, it's nothing new. <laughs> I mean, yeah. um, can you tell us like about your university experience? Like, because um, you know, like UCLA is obviously one of the greatest uh, universities in. United States, so you know, like what go was your Bruins. Experience? Yeah, go <laughs> so uh, what was your experience? You know, like, I loved UCLA. Okay, uh, I got to meet other Chicanos and Chicanas and uh, other progressive folk who had the same ambitions and understandings of what was going on, and so we organized and uh, created an organization first called UMAS, United Mexican American Students. And then later we changed it to Mecha, Movimiento Estudiantil Chicano de Atzlan. And our goal was to go back to our original high schools and help our younger brothers and sisters 
to understand that they could go to college, that they could choose what they wanted to be in life and work at it, uh, no matter what the schools said, uh, no matter what their teachers said. And so we started a revolution. We started an educational revolution. And going to UCLA gave me that platform, that freedom, to see what was possible in life, and also the freedom to associate with other like-minded people and organize. So have you two seen the movie Walkout? Yes, yes we watched it. Movie. It was a really great movie. You liked it? Yes, it was amazing. All right, so you know I'm a character in it. Yes, yeah, we've seen, seen it. It was really good. Okay, good. So that's what I did in college. I was a rabble rouser. I was a troublemaker. <laughs> I said, we're not going to put up with this anymore. We deserve the same opportunities as everybody else. We deserve to be encouraged to achieve our dreams. And uh, we're going to change the world so that can happen. Wow, you really did. Yeah, you did for a lot, a lot and especially in, in the history of L.A. and high schools. Yeah, because I mean, like we seen the movie, like how, um, like we seen the movie, like how you, um, how they used to beat children for um, talking Spanish, and like, imagine having that today. It would be like it would be really bad, because I mean, most of us grew up, growing up with parents that are like Latinos and all that, and Chicanos and everything like that. So it's like it's crazy to see that. that yeah. Back then they used to do that. Yeah, they used to swat us, absolutely, and uh, make us feel like being uh, Mexican or Latin American, was bad. Like, it was something to be ashamed of. I felt ashamed when I was in middle school because of what I was learning in school and looking at the community that I was in where there were no professionals, right? There were no doctors, lawyers, engineers, business people of big companies that were uh, from our community. And so it made me feel like I was not as good as white people, right? It made me feel like I was uh, meant to be poor and ignorant uh, and just a worker. Happily, my father told me otherwise, and that created a real conflict in me, and I was, like, angry with my dad when I was in middle school. Like, you know, he doesn't know anything, right? He's just a cook. And my teachers know something, so that conflict was something that boiled in me. And so I started studying on my own, and I started studying history on my own. And I used to spend most of my time in, in middle school, downtown at the public library, just a few blocks from this high school. I used to take the bus down North Broadway, go to Fifth Street, walk up Fifth to the big library. And uh, I did have one teacher, a guy named... Uh, Tom Kelly, Mr. Kelly, who was Irish background, who really was very committed to having his students succeed. And so I'm thankful to him. And that made a big difference. So I was able to prepare myself. So even though, generally speaking, I didn't get that good of an education at Lincoln High School, what Tom Tully did for me uh, gave me enough so that I could succeed at UCLA. Then I graduated summa cum laude. I think I had about a 3.75 grade point average, and I went on to grad school. So going back to your first question, I loved college. <laughs> wow, that's a lot. That's a lot. That's, that's, that's cool. Like, yeah. Hold the mic. Oh, no, that, that's, that's really cool, you know. Because I'm a UCLA fan myself, and but I don't know if I'm gonna go there. But you know, it's too much money to go. There. <laughs> but yeah, um. you shouldn't worry about the money. Okay, what'll happen when you go to college and you graduate is that you're gonna make more money. All right, that's like statistically proven. If you drop out of high school, you're going to have a limited earning capacity. There are some exceptions some people who just have natural talent and become business people. But the vast majority, they're not going to do as well. If you go to college and graduate, you're going to do better. If you go to grad school, even better yet. So you will get scholarships. You will get uh, 
student loans, and UCLA's not that expensive compared to the Ivy Leagues. Now, the other thing that's interesting is that many of the Ivy Leagues will give you a total free ride. They'll pay for your tuition, your room and board, your books, your transportation. So it could even be cheaper to go to Harvard or Yale than to UCLA. So don't let the money stop you. You can figure that out. You got this. You can get scholarships. <laughs> um, so what I wanted to know is what inspired you to become a producer? Because I know like, you produced a lot of things. Um, what inspired you to do that? When I was in high school and middle school, I loved the arts. And probably the main reason that I didn't drop out myself was that I would spend two or three, sometimes four periods a day in school in the arts in one way or another. So I was in the madrigal singing. I was in the marching band. I was in the jazz band. I was in the speech club. I was in the drama club. And those are the things that inspired me, that made a difference. And so that prepared me. You know, I was also in student government. And I was also a photographer. And so I ate all that creative input up. I just loved it. It was what inspired me. And it's important to figure out what you love to do, right? Um, because it is possible in your life to both love what you do and have what you do love you. And that can be anything, right? You can be a carpenter and love it, and the carpentry will love you. You can be a cook. My dad was a cook. My dad ended up being one of the best chefs in the United States. He was a chef of a restaurant in Beverly Hills called La Scala, and uh, that was one of the top restaurants in the world back then. So I grew up hearing stories from my dad about Hollywood because the top stars would go there, both from Mexico and the United States and Hollywood. And when I was then finally at UCLA, and we were organizing, and we were getting ready for the walkouts, I got tasked by a teacher, Sal Castro, who if you saw the movie, was a big inspiration, to be in charge of the media and to call up the newspapers and the radio and the television stations to have them show up to report on the walkout. And that ended up leading me to this radio station, KPFK, which is a progressive station. And we figured, OK, they're going to want to report on us. And we went there, and they really kind of dismissed us. Um, it was a radical radio station that had very few people of color, if any. I don't remember any when I first arrived. And we had to take it over. That is, we occupied the, the radio station. We did a sit-in and demanded that they allow us to have airtime to tell our story. So fortunately, they, when they saw that we did that, they then embraced us and they gave me a radio show. And that radio show became my first step into being a producer because I had to produce my own show. So that, with all the other background I had, including having been an actor, and, um, led me when I was on campus at UCLA to focus on the film school as a place that we would, as a MECHA organization, organize and bring diversity to. So there were hardly any black, Asian, Latino, Native American students in the film school. So I wrote a proposal to create a new curriculum called Ethnocommunications. I recruited students got them some money, and then I organized a sit-in in the dean's office of the film school 
until they happily agreed to create that program and make it official. And we were lucky. It didn't take long. The dean was a progressive, and he thought it was a good idea. So we only had to sit in one day. Now, I didn't know that I was going to end up in that program. I thought I was just organizing that program because I w had been trained as an organizer, um, otherwise known as a troublemaker. <laughs> and uh, I then went back to my own department, which was a history department, and took a class in California history, and I cited what were considered to be revisionist texts. There were new books that had just been written that had a different take on the history of California that looked more at the original settlers, the Native Americans, the Mexicans, the African Latinos who actually settled California and founded the city of LA. And there were two books, The Decline of the Californios by Leonard Pitt, I still remember it, but it was a brand new book, and another book called North from Mexico by Kerry McWilliams. So I cited those books in my final exam, and not the book written by the professor. So he gave me an incomplete, right? He didn't fail me, he gave me an incomplete. He called me in and he said, you don't have a future in the history department. Listen to that. Isn't that kind of funny? <laughs> no future in the history department? <laughs> so you got to remember to talk into the mic. You need two mics. Ask for it and you'll get it. <laughs> so um, I then retreated to the film school just to graduate. And so I got my degree in film, and then I was going to go to grad school. And I applied in political science, public affairs, and I got turned down everywhere. Now, I was a good student. I had good grades. But at the moment that I was applying, I was still facing life in jail for being indicted by the grand jury of L.A. twice for organizing strikes. And I had not yet been acquitted. I was ultimately acquitted and charges were dropped. But the film school wanted me to come back, right? Because I had created the program there of ethnocommunications. So I went back and went to grad school at UCLA in film. And my thesis film, you had to make a thesis film. I was very lucky. It won an Emmy. And that pretty much launched me into a professional career as a producer. That's a lot to do just to be in like a film class. Because I know in UCLA now you can be in a film class by just asking. That's true. Um, so you told us about your profession as a producer. Um, what's your, like, what is your, um, what, can you tell us more about it? Because I know you touched on it a couple, like a couple times earlier. Um, can you tell us more about it? Well, after I graduated with my Master of Fine Arts and my thesis film, which had won an Emmy, and I had aired on um, Channel 4 here in the NBC-owned and operated TV stations, I then uh, went all over Hollywood to all the studios trying to get a job, and I couldn't get a job. So I heard about a new production company called Bilingual Children's Television, that was proposing to start a program similar to Sesame Street. You guys all know Sesame Street? Mm -hmm. Yes. So they were getting ready to start a program called Villa Alegre. And it's probably been off the air too long. But it was on the air for about 15 years. And so I wrote a proposal to them to create a new film training program. And they funded it. And so I uh, recruited half a dozen students that I put through an accelerated intensive film program. And many of them ended up working in the industry in film as cameraman, as a sound man, as a editor. And by having done that, 
I got to know the people at Bilingual Children's Television. This all happened within a year. And they gave me a job as a producer. And I was the film producer of this children's show that aired on PBS right after Sesame Street. And so right out of college, one year out, I was a network PBS producer, and I helped produce 65 half hours children's programming. And uh, that really was where I learned my skills as a producer because I did over a hundred short little films in one year that I supervised, produced, um, and uh, that I contracted out to other filmmakers and that, that I then uh, supervised in terms of their completion. So that's where I got my real training, right? So what you could call postgraduate training. And then we went into a hiatus, meaning we stopped working, we completed our 65 half hours, and we had a three month hiatus, means no work. And I had a crew that I had put together, and I didn't want to lose them, so I started going to other children's shows and pitching them to give me work, to let me produce short films for them. By short, I mean one, two, three minutes just like you see these little film segments on Sesame Street. Yeah. And I got work from a show called Infinity Factory and another show called Vegetable Soup and The Electric Company and Sesame Street. So I set up my own company, and I never went to work for anyone else again. I became an entrepreneur with my own company making films. Well... PBS Kids is a big show now, especially between the younger kids now. Um, well, you talked about films that you have done. Um, can What is the first film you ever were part of in any way? Like, just directing, besides the one you just told us, any, any others that you have been that's big or hasn't been, like, really known to many people? Well, my first film that was shown publicly was a student film and it was called Requiem 29 and it's a documentary that I did when I was a uh, junior at UCLA about the riots, the police riots that happened in East LA on August 29th 1970 that resulted in the death of an LA Times reporter, Ruben Salazar. And uh, I had marched with him that day, and the police went crazy and started beating up people. It was a peaceful march against the Vietnam War, and there were over 20,000 people that marched that day. And we got together at a park in East LA that was then called Laguna Park. Today it's called Ruben Salazar Park in honor of, of the newsman who was killed that day. And there were families, and it was like a picnic, and there was a music, and there was concerts, and there were food vendors. And then bef just out of left field, literally, we started to see hundreds of police, sheriffs and LAPD, rushing the crowd and beating people up and shooting tear gas at us. And I had several film crews, and we captured that. We captured that footage. And I remember talking to Ruben Salazar, and he had a cameraman as well. He was a news director of Channel 34, KMEX. And I asked him for his footage, and he told me that I could have it because they had captured some amazing footage of police brutality and violence. So later that afternoon, Ruben went to a bar and had a beer, and the police disturbances were still going on, and a sheriff fired a, a projectile that is designed to penetrate walls, a tear gas projectile, into a dark bar with an open doorway, and it went through Ruben's head and it killed him. So that was the first documentary I made. 
and uh, it's aired on national television, and it, I submitted it to several film festivals, and I won a couple of awards, and that was my first film. That has a very deep story. Um, do you know where we can find that anywhere right now, or is it like on Netflix or like Hulu? You can get it through the UCLA Chicano Study Center. They, they have a copy. Okay. Um, do you have any family that also works in the in like in the entertainment industry? Yes, my daughter has been an actress and also a, a executive in film companies. Uh, you guys ever watch uh, the George Lopez show, the original one? Yeah. Right? So uh, she had a recurring role in it where uh, she was uh, uh, this, uh, played a, a chola who was his secretary and who was constantly saying to him, I know, huh? That's <laughs> the con. Do you guys remember that character? Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, that's my daughter. Uh, really? I know, huh? I didn't even know that. Oh, wow, that's crazy. That's wow. Uh, and uh, my two middle sons, one is an uh, uh, indie rock drummer, and the other one is a classically trained pianist who, from high school, he went to the Loxa to the Los Angeles County High School for Performing Arts, all three of them did. And from there he went to Moscow in Russia to the Tchaikovsky Conservatory. And he spent four years in Moscow being trained as a classical pianist. He went there when he was just barely 18 years old, straight out of high school. And um, he then graduated from Stanford with a degree in Russian literature. And he went to work for Google uh, in communications, and then he went to Columbia and got a master, uh, an MBA, a Master of Business Administration. Then his younger brother went to Columbia and got a degree in math and in music. Professional drummer, he's traveled the world, and then he went and got a degree in music technology from NYU. And he invented an algorithm that he wrote and he got a patent on it, and he started his own company, and his brother and sister work with him. The company is called Sunhouse, and it's a new way for musicians to create music. Wow. Um, what was it like being a part of like, like such historic like moments, such as the walkout? Like, like how was it? Well, it was intense, exciting scary, exhilarating, and it gave a powerful meaning to my life that I was getting to do something that was important and that was going to help people. So that's been an important theme for me, being committed to helping our community and uh, to being service, of service to people. Part of the reason that I helped found this school Wow, well, that's, that's amazing. Um, you know, did your parents support you when you were uh, doing the walkout? My mother died when I was a year and a half old, so it was my father that was taking care of me and my aunt. Um, I hardly saw my dad because he worked six days a week, 12 hours a day. However, the time that I did spend with him, he was always supportive. And he pretty much inspired me to be an activist because he believed in social justice. And he was always talking to me about what happened in Mexico and the revolution there and why that revolution took place and how people were being exploited and how the revolution was designed to free them. And so he was always supportive. So he never criticized me and when I was arrested and facing life in jail, he was always supporting me. That's um, like so when you did the walkout like was he watching you on TV or nothing well he knew what was going on because it was all over the news I don't know that he saw me on TV but he certainly uh, knew when I was arrested and uh, knew when I was going to court uh, and uh, I would always go home 
and talk to him and share him what I was doing, and he was always supportive. Um, like when you say you got arrested, like um, like 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 how did it um happen? Like like what did you do to get arrested? Like, what were you? The first time, um, the charge was conspiracy to commit a misdemeanor, disrupting a public school. So if you read the indictment, what they say I did was is that I got together with people and I planned a student strike and to disrupt the schools, to bring attention to the fact that the schools were not supporting us or encouraging us to go to college and they were giving us an inferior education. So I was guilty. I did that. Now, but the point is, that's protected behavior by the Bill of Rights, right? So freedom of speech, freedom to petition the government for redress of grievances, freedom of assembly, right? Those are protected rights that we all have in the United States. So the government, the mayor, the grand jury, the district attorney, were abusing their power and were trying to shut us down, okay? Much in the way that our current president and his attorney general are abusing their powers by turning people away who are seeking asylum at the border, by separating children from their parents. And the courts are telling the president and his attorney general, that's a violation of constitutional law. So in my case, attorneys filed motions, and it took several years, and the charges that were used to arrest me were thrown out. They were dismissed as our actions were protected by the Constitution. A year later, I was indicted again. Again, <clears throat> conspiracy to disrupt a public assembly. And there were additional charges that were levied. Burglary, tampering with electrical wires, arson, conspiracy to commit all the above. And that time I was facing life in jail. And I was on trial for basically three years, all my undergraduate career. Again, most of those charges were dismissed on appeal as being in violation of the Constitution. And other charges were dismissed because there was no evidence, right? And, and some of them were just plain stupid, silly charges, like the tampering with electrical wires. You know, what came out was is that somebody tripped over a mic cord and the mic got disconnected. Uh, silliness like that. Burglary was claiming that I didn't have a ticket to be at a banquet that we had protested. And I did have a ticket. So they would dismiss that charge. The arson one was pretty serious. And in that case, an uh, undercover police officer had infiltrated a group called the Brown Berets. There were several police officers that had infiltrated. And uh, they had official positions. One was in charge of tactics. The other one was in charge of training. And they were the only ones that had a car. And they convinced some of the Brown Berets to go to the Pet Boys and buy some flares and then go to the Biltmore Hotel where this banquet was happening at a conference on education, which is why I was there, and to light the flares and start a fire in the linen closet. That's really dangerous and criminal. And when I arrived at the Biltmore, I was wondering why there were uh, fire engines all around the Biltmore. So the police knew that this was going to happen. They had actually put the idea in uh, some of the Brown Berets' heads. And they stupidly went ahead and did it. Uh, but I wasn't part of that. And so that charge was dropped against me as well. So ultimately, I went through a full jury trial on the charge of conspiracy to, to uh, disrupt a public assembly, and I was acquitted. That one should have been dismissed, but they allowed it to go through a full jury trial. 
So for the better part of three and a half years, almost four years, I was either under indictment or in trial. The entire time I was an undergraduate student at UCLA. Mm. Wow. <laughs> so just for the dumbest things, they would just arrest you? Like stuff well, that you weren't it, even a part it was, of? It was dumb because it was protected behavior under the Constitution, but it was a deliberate attempt to stop us from organizing and demanding our rights. And they didn't want that to happen? They did not want that to happen. But it didn't. It didn't, end up it didn't stop us. We were willing, the students that I was a part of, to sacrifice and to take those risks to change possibilities for you, for yeah. our younger brothers and sisters, and for 50 years later, for you here in this school. When you talked about the walkout, um, you talked about other students, and we can we saw in the movie that you also were very um, in touch with the students in your classes and encouraged them. Did you, after the walkout, did you keep in contact with anyone? Sure, I still have friendships with many of the students that were the leaders of the walkout, uh, and I see them at various gatherings. And recently, last year in particular was the 50th anniversary of the walkouts, and so I got to see them almost every month at some <laughs> event or another. <laughs> and uh, uh, I was um, really happy to see them and that they had done well in their lives, even though they had been threatened and uh, had risked a great deal. And they were high school students, right? So my college friends I see still fairly regularly. Um, and. Um, we still are inspired you know, by what we did then and are still committed to make a difference today. That's, a, that's very good to keep in touch with students after that. I, they saw in the movie that they were very, that they liked you a lot because you helped them through some stuff that were in their school and encouraged them to do what they wanted to do. I thought that was really nice to do that because not many teachers do that. You will always find people who will support you. You need to ask, right? If you ask for help, if you ask a teacher to be your mentor, more than likely they're going to agree and they're going to be happy to do it. You'll be surprised. People want to help each other. And ultimately, that's one of the few things that gives meaning and satisfaction to life, is helping others. Um. So besides other f doing films and a producer and an uh, and, and, and entrepreneur, is there any other hobbies that you like to do besides that, like in your free time? I'm really interested in health and alternative health. And so I've spent, oh, <clears throat> since I was a um, young boy, um, my father used to take me to curanderos. Uh, shamans. And so these are indigenous healers from indigenous traditions. And um, so I'm very interested in that. And so I've studied it and I've uh, participated in sweat lodges and healing ceremonies that are part of the Native American tradition. <coughs> and I've done a great deal of research in that area and in alternative healing. Uh, and so it is one of the things that I, I like a great deal and devote myself to in my spare time to study. Wow. Um, besides, like, you know, your your amazing career in entertainment industry, you know, like, we know, like, that you're one of the founders of the station, you know, as well as the school. Um, like, what kind of, like, made you open up a school? Or open up this school? My children got to go to the High School for the Performing Arts on the campus of Cal State LA. And they got to go there because I'm successful and I was able to get them tutors and take them, my wife, to special classes so that they could be competitive um, in applying to that school because you had to audition to get into that school. And I realized 
that this was a privilege that the rest of the working class children in the neighborhood surrounding that school didn't have. And so I felt an obligation to do what I could to open up that kind of support by having a performing arts school uh, that children could get exposure and uh, training that I was able to give my own children, which is why I then helped to start this school. And this school has a dance program and starts at the sixth grade and a music program and this radio station. And we have also a filmmaking program so that those of you who may fall in love with these things can actually have them available to you in the arts program. All of these things are, are programs that aren't that available in regular public schools, right? So there's very few public schools that have it. And so I wanted to extend myself beyond what I did for my own children to as many other children as I could. Why did you aim to educate Latinos um, about business and media production? Hollywood has a huge power over how each of us think of ourselves and see ourselves. So for the longest time, the only images that you could see of Native Americans, African Americans, Asians, Mexicans, were subservient, uh, stereotypical images. We were either farm workers, criminals, bandits, servants, maids, prostitutes, junkies. Those were the typical images that Hollywood created in the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, the last 10 years, until recently. The movie um, Black Panther is a groundbreaking, amazing film that couldn't have been made 50 years ago. Hollywood would not have allowed it. Uh, the movie Crazy Rich Asians, which shows Asians in a completely different light where they have power, was not possible 20 years ago. Uh, the movie Coco, mm. right? That was, yeah. Not live action, but still about Mexican culture. Major release wasn't possible 20, 30 years ago. And because Hollywood creates these images where they need they need villains or they need secondary characters that can be killed off. And we were those victims. So I believe it's really important for us to gain the skill set to be filmmakers, to be storytellers, to change those stories so that there can be more movies like Black Panther, more movies like Selena, more movies like Waka. Right? More movies like Crazy Rich Asians. More movies like Spy Kids, right? Which is all Latino cast. <laughs> that was okay. That was more that was movies like La Bamba. Okay, these are all movies where we got to be heroes, right? But they're rare. And they make money, they're successful, but Hollywood doesn't follow up on it up to now. So it's going to be your job to change that. It's going to be your job to uh, support the movies that do get made so that they're successful and to be the filmmakers, writers, producers, directors, agents, managers, composers, editors, camera people for the next generation. Well, um, we're kind of reaching to the end here. Um, so, you know, thank you for coming and you know talking with us and all that show, um telling us about all of this you know yeah um, is there any projects or events that are coming up that you like to shout out to our listeners that are listening in right now well most of my energy is going to creating a movie theater circuit 
So it's a company called Maya Cinemas, and I've got movie theaters uh, in working class uh, minority communities all up and down California. So I've got a theater in Bakersfield, one in Delano, one in Fresno, one in Salinas, one in Pittsburgh, California, which is up north, and I just opened up one in North Las Vegas, Nevada, on Las Vegas, on Las Vegas Boulevard. So I'll be opening up more theaters, and this is a place where I get to support indie filmmaking and uh, filmmakers that are coming up with new uh, films that are about us. Wow. Okay, well, um, thank you again. Um, thank, thanks for listening to 101.5 KZKAFM. Tune in next time for more content.